Thanks for coming. This, I'm Laura Friedman. I'm the assembly member for the 43rd. I know a lot of you, but not all of you, but I want to thank all of you for coming out on a Friday night. We don't usually do town halls on Friday nights, um, but I'm glad to see we have such a good turnout. Um, we did it on a Friday night because this year we are sharing our town hall with Tech Week, which is an event uh, the city of Glendale has, and we thought this was a perfect town hall to combine with Tech Week. And tonight is the last night of that great event in Glendale. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Ben Richards, who is one of our constituents who was at another town hall and suggested this topic, and we were really happy to be able to put this together. Thanks, Ben. So it's my job as a policymaker to make sure that we're prepared for what's going to come in the future. And autonomous vehicles are potentially very disruptive <coughs> technologies in that they have a lot of impacts beyond the obvious impacts of us not having to drive anymore. Something that I very much look forward to as someone who doesn't really love to drive, but with the autonomous vehicle comes a lot of other impacts. Impacts to employment, impacts maybe to safety, impacts to how we move around our streets, impacts to how we build and how we live and how we think about our roads. And so I wanted to put this panel together of a whole bunch of, of people that know much more about this topic than myself so that we could hear more about where we are with the technology and what we should expect. And I'm glad to have our Glendale policymakers here because this is going to change how we do our ordinances, how we build our streets, what we want from our developers in terms of parking. All of those things are going to happen and it's going to happen soon. And so the time is now to start paving the, the groundwork and preparing for all of that. So with that, I'm going to turn to the panel and I'm going to go and move over to the, where the panel is. As a regional director, I oversee business development and operations. So um, I started in San Diego where our corporate office is. I oversee about 80 facilities, uh, ranging from regular office building to hospital to special events, valley management, hotels. Um, and now I'm here in uh, Los Angeles area. Um, and we oversee about 100 locations between LA and Orange County. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marcel Porras. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. I oversee the Shared Mobility Group, which involves, um, includes taxis, um, bikes, scooters, scooter shares, um, car sharing, uh, mobility hubs, and I'm also doing a lot of the early work uh, with our general manager to um, around autonomous vehicles and transportation technology and data. And so that's uh, really excited to be here. Um, hi, my name is Jin Ke. I'm from Caltech, working on automated driving. So right now I'm working on um, controller verification and synthesis so that the automated car is able to behave well around human-driven vehicles. In particular, they should save fuel, be safer, make the traffic flow in general more efficient. Um, prior to joining Caltech, I was at the University of Michigan working on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and the connected automatic vehicle design and how the influence on the traffic flow would be. Hi, my name is Juanita Martinez and uh, I'm uh, with General Motors. I'm a regional manager. I cover California, Washington, and Oregon and primarily cover uh, legislation for the company. I'm also actively, as you can imagine, involved in the autonomous vehicle um, discussions here in, in the multiple states. And so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Good afternoon, good, good evening rather. Uh, my name is Rena Davis and I am a public policy manager at Lyft. Uh, I've been with Lyft for about three years. Um, Lyft is exploring a number of uses for autonomous vehicles, both on our platform and potentially building out our own, um, as well as partnering with a number of different uh, automakers to bring autonomous vehicles uh, to market and help uh, them put them into the cultural zeitgeist as quickly as possible um, when safety uh, is checking out and everything is um, is moving forward on that front. I've been uh, working on Lyft's uh, California public policy for about a year now and also manage our public policy in Colorado, uh, Alaska, and Alberta, Canada. Thank you. And uh, Rena came to us from Northern California just for this panel. And I, I don't know if you're local as well. Sacramento, so it's really great to have them travel all this way to be here with us tonight. Thank you. And I want to acknowledge another very important person in the audience, Sharon Springer, who's a council member from the city of Burbank. Thank you for coming to Glendale. And I'm sorry if I missed anyone. 
I also wanted to tell you that we are going to be taking questions from the audience by the way of note cards. So you'll see my staff circulating at a certain point. So think about your questions. I'm going to be asking a bunch and then be ready to write them down and then we'll get through as many of them as we, as we can. Uh, let's see, I'll start with Rena. Um, Rena, um, how, are, how is Lyft going to be playing in the autonomous vehicle, we'll call them AV, because um, we're all going to be experts soon. Uh, how are they playing in the AV space? What is Lyft's connection to autonomous vehicles? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so Lyft is thinking about autonomous vehicles in a couple of different ways. Um, first and foremost, uh, I think the Lyft that most people uh, use, that you may have used to get to this event this evening, uh, you open up your phone and you get a ride and you have a great conversation with your driver on the way there uh, or not, maybe you're on the phone, um, and you hop out and you kind of go about your day. And what we would like to do in one space is to put an autonomous vehicle uh, in, that, in that car uh, mode so that you're doing the same exact thing, you're opening up your phone, you're uh, hailing a lift, uh, but the vehicle that comes to pick you up is autonomous. Um, and what we see in the next five to 10, 15 years is that there will actually be an increased need for folks to be in those vehicles. So uh, you won't you know, kind of get into your lift in, in three years and there won't be anybody in there. There'll be a safety driver, there'll be somebody who's there um, testing the vehicle along with you um, and ensuring safety and, and uh, will be able to take over uh, should they need to. Um, so that's one kind of area. And, and through that partnership, uh, having Lyft be the platform for autonomous vehicles, we have a partnership with General Motors, we have a partnership with a number of other automakers. So as these cars are ready to be tested, uh, we'll be able to offer the opportunity to Lyft passengers to test those vehicles um, and take rides in those vehicles. One uh, important caveat to that is that if you're like my dad and you don't want to be the first one in an autonomous vehicle, uh, you will not have to be. And so you can, when it pops up and they'll say, hey, would you like to take this autonomous vehicle ride? You can decline and you can decline until you're comfortable. Um, and you can say no every time and, and there's no penalty to you. And when, you're, when you are ready to uh, experience an autonomous vehicle lift, um, then we'll be right there waiting for you. So that's kind of one area that we're working on. And then second area is that, you know, one of the things um, that our partnerships do is we are you know, able to leverage the technologies of other folks onto the platform. Um, but you know, the lawyers, and I, I'm a recovering lawyer, the lawyers have told us that we have to keep everything separate. So their data is their data, our data is our data. Um, and we r truly felt that in order to build the best autonomous vehicle platform, uh, that we would want to understand the way that these vehicles are functioning. And so we started L5. We have an office in Palo Alto, um, which is outside of our San Francisco headquarters, uh, where we're actually building autonomous vehicles and testing autonomous vehicles ourselves. Uh, so we've hired a number of different folks in the, from the automotive industry. We also have an office uh, in Germany um, that focuses on autonomous vehicle technology. So we're looking at it from a few different angles and you know, we're really excited about the different emerging technologies that are, that are coming to market. And, and how we can implement them safely um, and give folks the experience of autonomous technology. Great. Uh, I, I felt like autonomous vehicles all of a sudden got very real for me when I heard that General Motors is so heavily interested in autonomous vehicles. So what is GM's role? What, what is the vehicle you're working on? And what do you, do you see this as being a big part of your future? And if so, what's the rollout plan? What, how many years are, is this for my daughter or is this for me? I think it's going to be for all of us here in the room. And uh, I, you know, GM is really excited about moving into this technology. And this isn't a technology that we just started looking at to, into five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. This is something that we've been working our way uh, up to for the past 100 years of um, our development. If you're in a vehicle right now and you have um, power steering, if you're in a vehicle and you have power windows, if you're in a vehicle and you have anti-lock brakes, these are each steps that we have taken over the years to get us to where we are at now. So this isn't something that we just opened, you know, woke up one day and our uh, 
you know, Mary Barra, our CEO, decided that this was something that she wanted to do. This is something that we have been working toward for a hundred years, and we're very proud and excited about this technology. Uh, we took a very giant step uh, in 2016, and we acquired a company called Cruise Automation in San Francisco. Now they have been doing all of the um, the installation of the vehicles and doing the testing. What we decided to do was to um, acquire the company and then install that technology onto our vehicles, which was the Bolt EVs, which is our pure electric vehicles that go 238 miles per charge. Um, so we're very excited because that's the fleet model that we're looking at and that's the technology that we're looking at. Um, we decided to purchase the company and have it become more of an internal project versus uh, partnering with a uh, with a company or maybe just partnering with crews but actually acquiring them as a um as, as a company for us, because what this allows us to do is actually to manufacture the vehicles with the technology in them. So unlike some of our competitors who are purchasing the vehicles and then installing the technology on them, when these vehicles come off of the plant, out of our Orion plant uh, in Michigan, it actually has the technology embedded in the vehicle, in the bumper, Inside the bumper is actually where some of the sensors are. Inside um, the mirrors is where the technology is. So it's not going to be necessarily just something that's sitting on the outside, but we felt uh, it was important for safety for us to be able to have full control from the uh, ground up with these vehicles. And so we are very excited that we've opened up a full line in uh, Michigan to start uh, developing this technology and really putting it into the vehicle rather than it being added to the vehicle. Great. Jinji, you, you come to this from the scientist side. Um, uh, can you talk a bit about where the technology is in terms of what's most people's biggest concern, safety? Where are these cars right now, and, and wh where do you see this technology going to where y you would feel comfortable that it's completely safe to deploy? So um, to start with, we have, we have uh, six levels of the autonomy. Can you all hear? Alrighty, sure. So um, SAE categorized the driving autonomy into six categories, from the lowest category of uh, probably only having cruise control, which requires the human to keep uh, not only eyes on the road, but also continuously give certain inputs, like steering wheel or to disengage the car when it happens. So that level we don't have any problem in terms of scientifically. And the second level is, uh, or called level one, that's uh, um, we would have uh, connected, uh, would have uh, this uh, lane keeping or adaptive cruise control. And that part is also very sophisticated academically. So we are fine with that. Then we get into level two, which people say is roughly where the first generation of Tesla Autopilot is at, where it requires people to still monitor what's going on and uh, potentially would uh, allow hands and foot uh, to be away from their tasks. So that is a part where we are getting into some tricky engineering problems. So scientifically, we are ready in terms of solving those problems uh, analytically, but uh, being able to design a system that it is able to perform smoothly, that's still something interesting to look at. Then start from level three, that's when things get tricky because that is when we start to allow people to not monitor what's going on, but we still require the human to take over when anything weird happens. And that is a big research area right now. And level four and five, they start to get into a little bit like scientific fiction area. So they are not scientific fiction at all. They are coming into our life very fast. But there are very solid scientific questions we are not fixing yet. In particular, there are problems like when we have to either hit a wall or hit some human, then in that kind of emergency situation, what kind of choice we would make. And so far, we can only solve some equations with whatever utility function we assign to it, but we do not have a good answer in terms of how to translate our ethics, our values into those utility functions. 
And that's a big thing, and that's not only engineering, that goes across many of those science and engineering fields, and that is really interesting right now. Great, thank you. So Marcel, what is, DOT, what is uh, Department of Transportation doing right now to prepare? Is this something that's on your radar? Do you, are you having conversations at LA about how you incorporate your daily activities or how you're doing planning to accommodate AVs? And if so, what is it? what are you doing right now? Yeah, thank you. Um, so in 2016, we um, put together a plan called uh, uh, Urban Mobility in the Digital Age. And that really was thinking about how does the LA Department of Transportation prepare for autonomy? And as you can imagine, a lot of that really came down to what are, we, what are the existing functions that we do and, and how do we organize ourselves as a department? What are the things, how do we manage data? How do we communicate data across the taxi group, the transit group? Um, how do we use our traffic signal system to really organize travel and traffic through uh, the city of Los Angeles and really like, kind of laid a baseline, understanding that we were probably also going to need to have um, a change in, the way in, in how we staff and the skills that we have as a department. I think for a long time, the Department of Transportation has been very good at doing um, one thing, and that has been moving vehicles. But as we've started to um, think a little bit more about the, such the impact that vehicles have had um, on cities, the way that freeways have torn up communities, um, and this kind of reemergence to creating neighborhoods and communities, um, we've started to think really thoughtfully about what is the role of AVs, right? And, and how can this new technology um, improve our lives rather than um, further separate our communities? I think there's a couple of different scenarios. There's like this utopic, you know, everyone is, you know, um, having a good time drinking a glass of wine on their way to the theater with their, their friends. Um, they can move further out. But I think some of the early indicators that we've seen from the rise of um, TNCs like Uber and Lyft is that it does change the way you think about mobility, but are like what are those negative externalities that could happen if a city doesn't really get in there and engage and manage them? So when you think that um, congestion has risen with the rise of um, Uber and Lyft, right? Um, emissions have um, increased from according to a UC Davis study that's done that. Um, but it is up to us as city and state to really make sure that the impacts of these new technologies are happening, that they're um, impacts that positively impact our lives. And so for us, we've been really focused about what we do good best as a city and what we've done forever. So when you think about um, what what is the role of a, a DOT in a city, you, you, you encounter it every day. The traffic signals, right? The parking, the, the red curb, the, the lane stripings. Um, we are very much at all times a, as a city in control and in organizing our public space and our, and our public activity. Now, and what we've currently used are really like analog tools, a stop sign, a red light, um, a parking meter, but really in the way that, um, that technology companies have started embracing technology to manage these fleets in real time um, through really complicated algorithms, the city really needs to do that as well and really look at how we can evolve these analog control systems that we have and make them digital. So how do we as a city make sure that we know where these vehicles are, how that those vehicles are engaging with the city's digital infrastructure to say, hey, I would like to park there. And instead of looking at the complicated parking sign, it's already digitally coded. And the, the city itself, digital infrastructure, can respond to that vehicle and say, yeah, you're good to park here. Or it can say, you can use this travel lane um, at this time because guess what? You're, not, you're a shared electric autonomous vehicle. So it's, again, using what our policy priorities are and our outcomes to engage that. But that work is really just starting. And um, one of the really cool examples that we're using right now is this. Um, you, I'm, are you guys aware of all the scooters that are like, so um, so LA is really leading um, the nation right now in using this concept of digi digital enforcement and management. And we're developing, we're co-developing um, with other cities in real time and sharing the, the open source code. Um, we are actually meeting with um, Uber at their headquarters in Santa Monica on Monday because they bought a, a bike share company. And it's not me and 
you know, Rena, um, like the, go the government affairs people, it's like our engineers. And so we're having our digital technical engineers meet with theirs and saying, the, the, the rules of the game haven't changed. The city still wants to control and know where you are and give you permissions. Um, and so, but we're gonna do that digitally. And so this is the code and the API um, that we expect you to abide by. And so that's been really exciting. Um, and I think is really laying the foundation, even though we're just doing it with scooters, actually is um, laying the foundation for autonomous movement and then even drones, because those are actually gonna come to really quick. Great. Well, one of the things that's the most exciting to me about the idea of AVs is the efficiency of them, not just in terms of the driving and the congestion, but for land use. And so much of our land is used for things like parking lots. So if I didn't have to have a car, if we all just sort of called up fleets of AVs, I don't have to have a garage at my house, or I could actually put things in it. Um, although I don't, have a, I don't have a carport, but you know, the idea of not having to require developers to build parking lots on their buildings in the future means a lot less cost to build, and potentially being able to bring rents down because those costs then don't get passed along to the renters or the person, people who buy the, the units. Um, not to mention just all of the space right now that are parking lots that could one day be reclaimed as housing or as parks or as other things. So my question uh, for Claudia, given that you're in the business of parking lots, mm -hmm. what, how do you see AVs impacting your business and is your business going to be out of business or is there a way of, I, I assume these things still have to be stored somewhere. Yes. They're not all gonna be driving around all the time. And I think that you have some slides also of some, some visioning that your company has done. So if you wanna show those to us now, maybe sure. this is the right time. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, am I gonna have a job in five years, in 10 years? <laughs> 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 um, in reality, um, <laughs> In the past, uh, you know, just a, just a real life example, our company started in 1950. It's, our parking industry has been evolving the past 50, 68 years. Um, you know, we started from a small little lot with just a cigar box, you know, attendant, you know, charging 25 cents to, you know, an attendant charging with a um, register. And then now you've seen fully automated garages, full, you know, license plate recognition. So I mean, essentially, the industry has been evolving. And the past five years, we have seen very, very significant changes uh, with regards to the rideshare program, uh, Lyfts and Uber. Um, it highly impact our restaurant and nightlife bi business, um, hotel operations, because instead of you renting a car and paying the hotel overnight fees, you pretty much just Uber or Lyft. <laughs> so it definitely changed, um, but you know, we are prepared. Uh, we know tomorrow land is coming, but we don't know when. <laughs> um, but essentially, in our, the consensus in our industry is that um, changes is coming and we have to be adaptive to it, you know. So um, I'll, I'll share with you just this one slide, um, like if you want to move the next one. This is an Easter parade in New York City. The one on the left is year 1900. You could see a small little circle. It shows one motor vehicle. And then year 1913, you see only one horse and carriage and it's all vehicles. So changes happen in just 13 years. So I mean, eventually, you know, who knows? In 10 years, we might be in this panel again and we'll be like, wow, like things have changed so much. So it's just things have rapidly changed and it's definitely affecting our business. But we are taking of this as new opportunities for us. Um, you know, as, as we evolve, you know, you ask me if I'm, you know, is parking industry, no. Because there's still gonna be a lot more opportunities um, you know, see the ordinance is gonna change. Uh, we already seen it from Ly Lyft and Uber where, where are, you know, where can we drop off people safely? Um, you know, so I foresee this, uh, I foresee us instead of moving from a traditional parking management company, hey, do you have an attendant that could, you know, charge for parking or, you know, can you uh, convert my, you know, attendant location to a fully automated? We will become more of a mobility service provider where we gonna help the, you know, we gonna work with cities. Um, cities are becoming smart cities right now. Uh, so we're gonna be working with them in terms of, you know, where is the drop off lanes? Uh, you know, how are we gonna safely transport people uh, from, you know, all these vehicles that are gonna be moving around 
So, um, so um, if you could go to the next slide. So there's gonna be, you know, um, one through seven. These are the different variety of stuff that we foresee it's gonna happen now. Uh, are you, if you're gonna ask me if this is gonna really happen, no one knows for sure. But eventually there's gonna be, number one, there's gonna be a fast lane where you know, this is designed for people to just come in and out very quickly. Maybe there's a designated area just for a 10 minute increment parking where you know, people just move really fast. There's gonna be a share parking logistic lens. I'm talking about curb management. You know, if there's all these all this autonomous vehicle moving around, you know, where we could safely drop off passenger or when you're waiting for someone to come in, uh, where they could safely stand by. There's nothing like that right now. Um, there's gonna be parking for share vehicle, um, you know, and parking for autonomous vehicles. So there's share vehicle. So, you know, you hear Rina talking about um, Lyft being, you know, more of a share um, environment um, versus someone like me that, you know, I, I need to come in and out, you know, all day long. I mean, I drive from LA to Orange County to back to LA again, and I can afford to have, I live in Long Beach, I can afford to send my car to Long Beach, so I need a place to park my autonomous vehicle. Um, you're gonna see more of a reservation, wayfinding become more technology advanced. So just like what um, Marcos has mentioned, you know, instead of you just um, looking at, you know, where can I park, you can uh, basically communicate digitally. Uh, and then valet service is not gonna end. I mean, there's gonna be that, you know, top percentage of people that will want to have that premium service and it will become more of a concierge service where you know you could drop off your car get your vehicle car wash um, or you know dry clean pickup and whatnot um, and I see a lot of first and second floor parking garages becoming a retail oriented uh, because again it provides convenience for people to come in and out of the garage so. thank you <laughs> I'm gonna ask Claudia and Gingy and Juanita, I think. Actually, maybe not Claudia, sorry. Um, Rena, ask all of you, um, if you had to bet, when would you bet that you have your autonomous fleets in circulation, not on a testing uh, model, but actually kind of like that second slide of maybe there's a few holdouts, someone has their classic car that they love and they love driving it, um, but when is it going to be the standard to have autonomous vehicles on the road? Are we, think, are we talking three years, 10 years, somewhere in between? What, it, what are your companies seeing and what do you think from the scientific side? Whoever wants to start. Um, so we think, I think, actually that we'll see these in our lifetime, which is what Anita was saying. Um, within five to 10 years, uh, you'll start to see autonomous vehicles. I think there's a few things that you know, will impact the availability depending on where you are. A place like LA, uh, where you've got relatively good weather all the year, you know, all year round. Um, not a lot of environmental factors to deal with. Not a, there's hills, but you could kind of cordon it off into areas that are that are that are more flat. Um, I think you'll start to see autonomous vehicles on your streets uh, very soon. Um, you know, I think part of it as well is there's some regulations that will need to be kind of brought along. Um, and uh, the California Public Utilities Commission uh, is the entity in California that oversees uh, autonomous vehicles along with uh, the DMV, actually. And so it's a two-part system in which both of these entities are regulating autonomous vehicles. Uh, right now in California, uh, there are regulations around how, if you can receive payment for uh, rides in autonomous vehicles. Um, and so until the state of California authorizes folks to um, be actually able to provide rides in autonomous vehicles um, and to charge for them. Uh, we will see, uh, unfortunately, more of the testing, um, but I do think you'll start to see more testing in Los Angeles very quickly. Um, I think for us, we have active testing that's going on right now uh, in Nevada, um, and we're really anxious to bring that into um, the market of California. Um, so I think relatively soon, uh, I'd say, if anybody's got kids starting or uh, getting ready to start in high school in the next couple of years, they may be going to their prom in an AV. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, General Motors has been working toward this for the last hundred years, and we're very excited. And first and foremost, before we ever, ever put 
an autonomous vehicle out on the road for um, public use, we are looking at the safety of those vehicles and we're doing hundreds and hundreds of hours and thousands and thousands of hours of testing. In one week, we will drive enough miles to drive from San Francisco to New York and back. So that is the amount of testing that we're doing just on a weekly basis. And we are very excited about that. We have our testing in San Francisco where we have multiple vehicles um, testing on the road every single day. We have a facility in Michigan where we allow folks to um, send in a idea or send in, hey, what if there's a balloon that goes in the middle of the road, what's gonna happen? We will then take that simulation put it into the um, testing center in Michigan, and we will say, okay, let's have a vehicle driving at this speed and a balloon fly out in front of it, what happens? Um, so it's a controlled space with controlled, um, with a controlled environment, and so we get a lot of different simulated events and accidents that could potentially happen. So we're doing those as well, um, and we're very excited about that. Um, and I, I don't want to scare you with a solid date that GM has um, projected, but since our um, CEO has said um, we are looking at um, having autonomous vehicles out in the road, and let me just preface this with in a controlled geographically designated area. So <laughs> you won't see vehicles all over the area. Right now we are currently mapping in San Francisco. And so what we're doing and our, our belief is that we wanna make sure that these vehicles are controlled um, in a controlled space in a geographically designated area. So our vehicles right now are going up and down the streets of San Francisco where our vehicles are taking hundreds of pictures where we have hundreds um, and thousands of minutes of video um, on the vehicles and we're tracking and we're gathering all this data so that we know what to expect and what um, is out there in the streets. And if anybody's ever driven in San Francisco, you would think why in the world would somebody go out there? <laughs> why wouldn't you test somewhere else? But uh, you know, Kyle, the, the founder of um, Cruise said, you know, if, if we can test there and we can succeed there, we can succeed anywhere. Um, so that's really what we're going for um, because you know, not only do they have you know, people double parking, there's sometimes triple parking and you know, there's, there's bikes and there's um, children and there's strollers and everything that you could possibly imagine out there in San Francisco. So that's really where we are focusing um, is, is testing out there in San Francisco. Um, so like I said, we are manufacturing the vehicles and we are starting to roll those out. And uh, Mary um, Barra has said that we're looking at a deployment date um, within a geographically designated area. <laughs> <laughs> Just remind you um, of 2019. I just wanted to add one thing to that as well. And to your question, um, I think the levels of autonomous, and Jim was great at explaining that in the beginning of the, of the program, there's going to be varying levels of autonomous that are rolling out at various times, right? So you might have a level three that rolls out maybe 2019. I'm not sure what Jim's, Jim's got some some very uh, aggressive plans, but you know, safety first and foremost in mind. And I think that's that's uh, constant through all the autonomous vehicle uh, manufacturers and providers. Um, but I think you'll start to see, you know, will we have that sci-fi vehicle with no steering wheel, you know, be ubiquitous? you know, kind of representing autonomous vehicles on our streets. I don't think we'll see that for some time, but we will see different levels. And you may get into a vehicle that seemingly is driven by somebody, but they don't have their hands on the wheel. Um, and, you know, that is a level of autonomous um, that we can that can help also to get us comfortable, right, with, with these. A lot of it is how comfortable are we as a population? How much are we trusting the safety, um, knowing that all these companies will not put something out until it's safe, um, but that, you know, we still have to make that extra leap as well um, as a culture. I'll just say one other thing. Uh, they're not cars, but there are fully automated train fleets out there. And I was able to ride one, a subway in Spain recently, that's fully autonomous. And um, you really wouldn't notice much difference. One thing that was great about it is that when you go into the station, you can't access the track at all. There's a, a plexiglass barrier with a door, kind of like if you've been to the Sacramento airport, very similar. And when the train comes in, it aligns perfectly, the door opens and you get on. And what they discovered was people really weren't worried about the train itself. They loved, particularly parents, moms like me, loved that there was no way a child or anyone else could fall into the track. So they were asking to, for all of their subways and light rail to be autonomous as quickly as possible, just for that feature. Um, but it's been running there for many years, and again, it's not in the road, but it is a fully autonomous vehicle. 
Yeah, um, I totally agree. Um, so actually, there's a trend that people have observed in the past that we tend to underestimate new technology in the near future, but overestimate what might come in the far future. So for example, in the 50s, the auto manufacturers, sorry, I couldn't remember which one, but yeah, can you hold on? sure, one of the auto manufacturers actually already envisioned the full-on automated driving with no stereo, no nothing, and it's a family of four playing cars in the car. And we are like 70 years from that and still trying. So what the academia can do is to keep pushing on the frontier of all the available knowledge we have in artificial intelligence, in machine learning, to make sure that whatever technology route the industry decide to take on, we could provide certain support. In particular for machine learning, a tricky thing is we could have all sorts of data sets and we could train a controller using that data set. But when new data comes in, there is no absolute guarantee how we would perform on the new data set. And we are currently working on that through formal methods, through a lot of new techniques, and there have been a lot of improvements over the past two years or one year. So there are a lot of smart people working on this, but indeed, as uh, our industry friends have mentioned, um, they would still uh, work s with a very high guarantee in familiar environment, in environment where we have complete map. We have a lot of testing procedures already done. And a lot of times it's not because we couldn't deal with a new environment. It's purely because when we deliver something to the end user, we want to be absolutely sure that we have the redundancy in the sensor. If something breaks down, if one of my camera is not working, then we are still fine. If my LiDAR breaks down, we are still fine. And that redundancy is uh, uh, a very important engineering problem. In particular, I come from Michigan, where unlike um, San Francisco or here, we had huge snow. And whenever that falls, computer vision starts to have problems. And the snow could totally cover the stop sign. And when that happens, we have to infer that here's a stop sign from the other motion information or from other clues on the road. So there are a lot of interesting problems, and all of those problems influence how soon level two, level three, level four, level five might come into our life. But uh, I think our industry is really very brilliant, and they are standing on the frontier in this, in the sense that they know what the problems are. And when we talk with the industry people, what we feel is that they are really picking on the important problems. And when we have the feedback from the industry, the academia is able to work well as well. Great. I'm going to ask Marcel, and maybe Rena also wants to chime in, about how AVs will impact traffic congestion. You already mentioned and you know, Lyft and some of the ride shares sometimes get you know, criticism now because the promise was to decrease congestion, but that may not be happening. So from your perspective as someone who manages traffic congestion for a living, and in yours as well, because I know this is a big issue that you're working on, um, how will AVs impact that? Yeah, so I think, again, there is like the utopian uh, vision of AVs um, just being all in sync and moving in a very coordinated fashion. I think that's that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> but, but I think that um, it also... One of the things that we're not contemplating um, it, or that we think must be a given is, you know, you're mentioning I'm going to park my AV over here. I'm like, we actually think that AV, there shouldn't be private ownership over AVs, right? I think we see them as a, as a fleet and I think as a, share, as a shared fleet to ultimately, or I mean, people could own their own AV, but I think, um, I think it's going to, we're moving away from ownership. In, in that stuff and I think it's going to be more um, mobility as a service and so I think you see a lot of um, it you know I think there, there's a reason why Uber and Lyft bought um, scooter companies and bike share companies it's because a lot of these shorter trips made sense in scooters or 
are on bikes, right? I think that, um, you know, we, we've seen some great, like, I love the fact that um, Uber and Lyft on their platform have, have adopted, like, Lyft Line or Uber Pool to incentivize and to push the shared mobility. I think that's really going to be the key for um, for the success of autonomous vehicles is that they're not only autonomous, but they're shared and then also electric as well. And then I guess the final place, I think what, what's there's a bunch of different acronyms for it. I think the one that I've been using lately is ACES. So it's autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. Um, and that connected um, piece talks more to the redundancy factor um, and being able to connect to the city's infrastructure as well. Yeah. I, I want to add to that. Actually, there's a conflicting surveys or conflicting study, but they say by like 2030, ownership of vehicles down by 80 <laughs> percent. There yeah. has been studies on that. Right so now, it's 80, 80 zero. Which is hard for, I'm sure, most of us Californians to imagine. <laughs> um, it's hard for me. Uh, but I think that's exactly right, and I think we're starting to see that trend in the younger people. I know that um, when I turned 16, getting your driver's license was that was the first thing that you did when you woke up. You got to get it, and you know that was the biggest deal. Uh, teenagers aren't getting their driver's license anymore. <laughs> when I heard that, I was just my mind was blown, and it's because they know there's multiple services out there. They can use different products to to get where they need to go. Um, you know, so I think that there's we're moving towards just exactly what you said as transportation as a service um, and that's exactly what our founders have put forth as their ultimate vision um, and you know you're exactly right as to why we, you know we we acquired motivate which is um, like a city bike service that you'll find in a number of different cities uh, Ford go bikes if you've been up to the Bay Area um, and I think it's it's something that we see as there has to be different pieces to this puzzle of how we get from point A to point B one of the interesting things um, before we get into that, is that that picture that you showed that had 1900 and 1913, and there was the one vehicle and then there was the one horse. Well, what happened in between in those 13 years? There was probably a lot of adjustment um, when those cars, you know, it's like there's very stark contrast there. Um, but what was, you know, what was the Easter Parade like in, in 19, uh, 1909? Um, and so I think that that's kind of where, where we're going. And we have an ultimate vision of getting into that very connected space in which things are humming along. Um, I think that for us, autonomous vehicles have a huge part to play in reducing congestion. I would respectfully push back on uh, the idea that, that Lyft uh, has caused congestion. And, and, you know, there are a number of different studies saying a number of different things. But I think we can all agree that more efficient use of transportation modes is what we want to move towards. And in fact, one of our co-founders, Logan Green, is actually from Southern California and came up with the idea for Lyft while sitting on the 405 parking lot. then we can actually have a huge impact, not only on congestion, but some of the slides that we kind of whizzed by were reclaiming our streets and you know, using you know, land for the public good and not for parking spaces and not for you know, um, you know, just taking over our streets for, for vehicles. But what if there was just two lanes? What are we gonna do with all of that extra space? We're not gonna make huge sidewalks, maybe we'll do parks, we'll have different vehicles you know, that we can use scooters and bikes. And so I think that for us, we see it all coming together in a transportation ecosystem, and we're really excited to see uh, organizations like LADOT thinking so far ahead and saying we've got to get in front of this problem right now because you know autonomous vehicles um, they're designed for safety to you know the point that we keep making on this panel. So if they cannot safely pick you up on Wilshire Boulevard, they're not going to do it. <laughs> it's just you're you're going to have to find another way to get where you're going. And so we have to kind of put in those, those, uh, those ecosystem, um, you know, for, you know, pick up and drop off zones, putting them in, putting curb cuts in that are going to allow for folks to get on and off curbs when they're on scooters and on bikes. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a huge role for us to play in figuring out how all those things work together. I think, though, uh, and to the summer's credit, folks like herself and leaders are starting to convene these groups more and more often so that this is not the first time that a lot of you know, folks are seeing each other or that these entities are talking. Um, they're moving ahead very quickly. Um, and you know, I think that 
having our elected leaders in the room when these conversations are happening helps to inform them so that then they talk to you and they go back and they do what they need to do to make sure that safety is first and foremost and that we're able to have transportation options for Californians. Can, I just want to add one last thing. I think the one thing that I forgot to mention is that mass transit is still going to be a huge key component of, of moving people in the city. Nothing can move um, people more efficiently than, than mass transit. And I think um, we're looking forward to the build out of the Measure M, Measure R projects. And I think b figuring out how we can organize all these other mobility solutions to complement that infrastructure is going to be key. And I'll say one last comment, so sorry, <laughs> one last comment on that, but, um, and I think that what it's really important to note is that in Lyft, uh, what we've seen is taking a look at our data, um, in some markets up to 60%, but usually around 40% of our trips start and end at uh, public transit hubs. So they're starting and ending at bus stops, at metro stops, at BART stops, um, and that is to me huge because people are using it in conjunction with public transit. One of my favorite tweets that I've ever I ever saw was someone who's a transit advocate and he was saying talking about people being impressed with you know showing off their cars and he said your car your Porsche she said today I got to work in a 30 million dollar vehicle chauffeur driven with 600 of my best friends. <laughs> so I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, let me ask um, Marcel and anybody else who wants to answer and since, since we have a couple of city council members here Given that this is coming in maybe five years, maybe less, is it crazy to have every housing development have to put two parking spaces uh, per unit that they're building? What's gonna, is that a crazy thing? Is it, should they be redesigning? What's gonna happen to all those underground parking lots? Uh, they can't all be uh, movie theaters. Um, you know, what, what are we gonna do? So are, should city planners be rethinking some of that? And I'll ask whoever wants to answer. Uh, we have seen it. Uh, we have um, cities basically change, you know, uh, or ma make it more relaxed. Um, in San Diego, for example, some of the new development, instead of you requiring, you know, two per thousand or four per thousand for office building, they requested what is called a transportation management plan. And they consulted with us and say, you know, basically they have to prepare a plan and most of the time we basically respond with a shuttle management or an off-site parking just in case if they are attracting a higher density tenants. So that's already happening right now. Yeah, and I think we're seeing it as well and folks wanting to put in spaces for ride sharing um, or wanting to work with us um, even in the short time that we've been in this bike space to make sure that there are docked bike stations um, and development, and that's all range of developments from you know uh, affordable housing all the way up to market rate housing. And I think that's exactly what we should be doing. Um, of course, we, we shouldn't eliminate parking spaces. People are still have we're still we're still closer to 1900 than 1913 in this sense. But um, we still do need to have uh, kind of that that pushing that progressive thought. Um, around reallocating. One of the things that's interesting in, in the city of Oakland, we have a uh, housing crisis in the Bay Area and in many other parts of California. And one of the things that you have to do to have an additional dwelling unit is to have a parking space. And so what they smartly did was to loosen those restrictions. It's not to do anything around the code of the, the safety of the building, but to say, let's make it easier by saying if you are within X amount of miles to a, uh, a bus stop that will service you know, within certain amount of you know, radius, then you don't have to have that extra parking spot. And so that, for us, makes complete sense, but it's actually a change that has to take place in the ordinances, and folks are actually starting to, to kind of think progressively and the ties between our housing crisis, our housing needs, and transportation, and how we can you know, kind of uh, solve a problem, uh, a couple of problems with, with one solution. Um, I think that some of you have some slides. Before I go to the audience, Quince, does anyone have slides you want to put up? And are they long slides, or can we do those? Anybody? Like 50 slides. Yeah. 50? 50 is <laughs> good, yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because I think the visuals are actually really helpful because we're talking a lot about land use, so, so go for it. So just real quick, GM's mission with respect to autonomous vehicles is zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero, zero congestion. Um, so we believe that the technology within autonomous vehicles is going to help get us to that place. Um, you know, one more. Um, so just you know, for the traffic fatalities that we see, 94% of those are caused by human error. Autonomous vehicles takes out those, uh, those numbers. So that's something that we're really excited about. 
Amanda, for the commuters, you're looking at uh, wasting a full week of your, of your life um, in traffic each year. And so I, I think it's probably more in LA, but uh, <laughs> um, with respect to parking, uh, th there is uh, three non-residential parking spaces per vehicle for the state. And again, we are deploying our autonomous vehicles with our Bolt EVs, which are pure electric vehicles. We believe that all autonomous vehicles should be electric vehicles. Um, they said here, sort of our mapping out here, um, our goal is to launch a driverless rideshare service in 2019. Um, that, I'm not going to tell you what quarter that is, but we are. <laughs> it could be December 31st, 2019. <laughs> it's, but, uh, and this kind of just gives you an idea you know, where I said we, have, we acquired uh, crews in early 2016 and you've seen sort of the different track in the models of the bolts that we've used and so we're sort of we're here today um, getting just one step closer um, and just kind of to give you an idea a little sense of what um, autonomous vehicle levels are um, so kind of a horse and buggy sort of over here on this space um, absolutely no control no wheels no uh, no brakes uh, on uh, level five. Right now, if you're getting into your vehicle, you're probably getting into a level one vehicle. Um, if you have made the amazing choice to purchase a Cadillac, you are probably getting into the uh, level two here, which is a, a super cruise and adaptive cruise. Um, so with respect to level two, what you're looking at with that um, is you're looking at the ability to drive in on the freeway without your hands or um, feet on the steering wheel. So we do have vehicles with a um, super cruise um, with that model. So you can, you can um, purchase those in those are on the road right now. Um, that's also when you kind of look at maybe like a Tesla, that's, they're still in the uh, level two or not. Um, nobody actually in, of the OEMs right now, the auto manufacturers are manufacturing level threes yet, so you're not seeing any of those on the, on the freeway. Um, you have some more of the, um, the international companies that are looking at more level three than the domestic, what we call the domestic kind of, um, V, um, OEMs that are looking at um, level four and this is when we talk about when GM talks about um, deployment in 2019 we're, we're talking about um, level four vehicles well now what level four vehicles would mean is um, there is no um, human driver in the vehicle there's no wheel there's no ped no um, brake pedals but it only functions in a geographically designated area so we would pick you know for example, here, Glendale, it would just be a certain area within the Glendale service. And if you wanted to go outside of that, then we would automatically partner you up with a um, vehicle that has a human driver in it. But if you're within the mapped area that we've um, created, you'd be able to travel and that would be a level four. Um, and then level five is um, the ability to be able to drive anywhere um, in fully autonomous mode without um, having a vehicle, without really having limitations. Um, and that, I think, is where some of our um, competitors are looking at is more of the level five. We like the idea of a little bit more controlled area, being able to pull the cars back if we need to. Um, so th that's what GM is talking about when we're talking about level four. Um, and uh, just kind of give you an idea, this is the, um, the plant that we are um, manufacturing the vehicles out of. So um, you can see um, from the top down, we are having full control over the vehicles and what's um, inside of the vehicles. Um, and we've produced and submitted the uh, safety driving report. Um, there were a few out there that I put on the table. So if you had a chance um, to, or if there's still some, please feel free to grab those. And that just gives you a sense of sort of where we are, what we're doing, what our vision for AV is, and how we are um, rolling that out. Um, just a, real quick, I don't want to go into too much detail, but just to give you a little more comfort, um, since I know you guys are all going to run out and jump in one as soon as you can. Um, this is what we're looking at. We have 14 cameras. We have three radars. We have five LIDARs. We have eight ra radars down in the bumper area. And we have 10 ultra short range radars. So we're not, you're not talking about a vehicle with a single camera on top spinning around. Um, there's a little bit more thought that goes into these vehicles and a couple more products uh, that we attach to the vehicles. And like I said, because we're manufacturing them, we're actually able to build the product and the technology into the vehicle, not as an after, afterthought. Um, and can you, is, is that connected to link on that? Okay. It's not doing it. Okay, so 
imagine, you can close your eyes and imagine right now, is um, this was a video, and you can actually look it up on YouTube if you want it. It's called Dolores Park Cruise, C-R-U-I-S-E, and it's a video of one of our drivers actually driving in autonomous mode um, to Dolores Park in San Francisco. So you can see in real time the, the gentleman's hands are off of the wheel. Um, so this gives you a, an idea of this is happening. It's actually out on the road, um, and it's moving. Um, and so just kind of, just to let you, just more of a visual of what we're doing, what our vehicles look like um, and what they're seeing. Um, looking at the, trying to figure out the unpredictable circumstances and the conditions, we're testing for those. Um, and we're um, really, it's something that's really important to us is what are the things that people can do? How, you know, is there a kid that's gonna run out in the street? How are we gonna react to that? How can we tell the difference between a kid standing on the street? You know, one of my, I have a four-year-old, so one of my concerns is if my four-year-old's sitting on the corner, I want that car to know that that's a four-year-old, that isn't a trash can, <laughs> you know? Or, you know, or maybe, you know, she's walking our, our dog and it, our dog is twice as big as she is and, you know, I want that car to be able to know, is that a dog or is that a, a child? And that's um, stuff that we are, we are testing for. Um, and so just to give you two, what we're doing with respect to our training, we have two operators in the, wheel, in the vehicles right now. Um, we have something that we're very proud of, of no cell phones allowed in the car period. So when our, our um, drivers or testers are in the car, they're fully focused on what they're doing. So there are no cell phones, um, even the, the one in the passenger seat. Um, we're working with law enforcement. Um, we set up demo days. We have OnStar. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but it's a system within General Motors that allows us to actually um, communicate. And one of the big things with respect to law enforcement is we have a direct line so that if there's an emergency, you can press the OnStar button and go directly to 911 and um, get an emergency service and first responders. Um, so that's something that we're excited about having that as part of the technology. Um, and another thing, you know, I won't really go over this, um, with it, but within uh, Los Angeles area, we're not just looking at um, at autonomous vehicles, but we also have another program and a sister company that we launched, Maven, which is looking at sort of the larger mobility, because we know that not everybody's gonna wanna get into an autonomous vehicle um, right out the gate, but we're looking at how do we partner with um, apartment owners, and do we say, okay, maybe apartment owners want to lease a subset of vehicles so that they don't necessarily have to have X amount of parking for all the residents, but there's a certain designated number of um, vehicles that are set just for that apartment complex. And so we're looking at kind of what are the other options of mobility out there to help folks because we don't necessarily see AVs as becoming um, part of a private fleet um, in the near future. We, we do see the deployment of them, but not in more in a secured fleet model. Um, but if anybody ever has any questions about other mobility programs that GM is doing, it's through Maven. And we're really excited to be um, here in Los Angeles and launching our Maven program out here. Yeah, 50 I, I have 50 a bunch of slides, slides, but I can just do, can you just do that one slide? Like, and while he's getting that, oh, you have it. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, this is the way we're starting to think about our, sp our, our space, right? Because we know that it's not just about autonomous vehicles, but really it, it is about drones. And so I think that we're looking um, at a future where we're, we, we define space um, vertically and horizontally, and we understand um, where things are moving through our space, right? And we can assign value to them, we, whether that's um, a cost um, assigning, whether we're helping to route trips. Um, and so I think this is particularly gonna help in the short term as we think about just the, um, the, the increased competition for, for curb space, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't know, remember the last time I actually bought toilet paper at a, at a grocery store? anymore like it's it's coming through amazon prime or you know all these things and and that's increasing and increasing like the other day i was with a friend and they ordered ice cream through uber eats you know and i was like <laughs> whoa right and so like th there's just all these the it's increasing competition for the curb and as city we have to we are the ultimate managers of that space um and so we're going to need to continue to do this so this is just um i thought like a fun illustration of how we're thinking about that um, and how we um, intend to be communicating with mobility operators um, in the city. I think there's one slide that I was going to show there. So this is kind of what I was talking about a little bit earlier and in terms of uh, what 
the future of cities could look like if we didn't have vehicles uh, that had to take up most of the space. Uh, so you'll see, I'm sure LADOT will love uh, most, uh, mass transit featured prominently there because we do think that will continue to be the, the largest mover of people in bulk. Um, and, you know, there's spaces around, and you can just kind of think, you know, in your day, if the island that we all see in the middle of our, you know, of our streets, if that's the actual street and everything else is, you know, for us to imagine what we want to do with it. Um, and so I think that's part of the joy of this technology and really it's, it's kind of allowing us to reinvent our cities again. You think if you've gone to different parts of the world, way that cities are designed, especially older cities, is not for vehicles, not for cars. So if you go to Europe, there's, you know, there's very narrow streets and it's because during that time, there were no cars that were running up and down those streets. There were people that were walking and there were maybe, you know, horse-drawn carriages uh, or something of that nature. Um, and so for us, I think it's incumbent upon us to reimagine it from what Lyft thinks the future could look like, but also to work and have a very strong relationship with not just LADOT, but with academic researchers, with assembly members, with constitu their constituents, so that we understand what the community wants. Uh, what we kind of imagine as, as the vision is probably part of it, uh, but there should be a, a fuller conversation, and so we're really excited to have that. One thing I do think is interesting, uh, just as a caveat, when we saw that cubed out version of our of a, of a, of city block, um, is there are so many laws that are gonna have to change around that management of that space, um, because folks, you know, right now have kind of indefinite property rights as you go up, um, and so it's, it's really gonna be a fascinating conversation that's not just gonna be about the things that we're thinking about, curbs and cars and LiDAR sensors and, and that kind of thing, but all of the things that are gonna kind of come into play as the future of our cities becomes uh, more advanced. Well, just to add to that, um, recently, like the FAA actually has asserted jurisdiction down to the blade of grass in front of your house. And so um, I don't think the FAA wants to be in that space, <laughs> um, like governing flight travel through your backyard. They don't want to be there. I think um, the city feels that it's probably has to, cities have to have roles in these decision making. And I think the technology is advancing so fast. One of the things that cities are doing is really advocating for a seat at the table, right? And making sure that we're not preempted um, in the way some of these decisions are made because um, because it's not the FAA who's gonna have to hear, it's gonna be, your, you guys are gonna be calling us and your assembly member and your council member to say, hey, what's going on? And so um, I think there is a continued role for cities at that table to make sure that um, we are harnessing the, the, the positive without um, the negative externalities. And I think also, you know, when you're when you're talking about that balance, um, I do think that there's a huge role for cities to play, um, but there's also probably a role for the state to play, and there's also probably a role for the federal government to play. Um, as safety becomes standardized, I think there'll be less questions around what's the best practice for X, Y, Z problem. And so when we're able to implement that on a higher level, but with the understanding that there's still gonna be a bulk of regulation that needs to happen at the city level and the county level even. Um, and so really figuring out where those lawn lines have to be drawn. Um, I know for it, it, for example, for ride sharing for, for TNC's Lyft and Uber, um, you know, there's a lot of regulation that's kept up at the state level because of the way that, that uh, ride share moves throughout, you know, crosses city lines, crosses county lines, can sometimes cross, cross state lines depending um, on where you live. Uh, so I think that there's some fluidity that we'll have to see, you know, as the technology emerges too. We know what it is for right now, so LADOT has their ideas, the city has their ideas, but there's going to be new technology that comes in and upends those ideas and staying nimble and being able to continue to have those conversations and, and iterate I think is the biggest uh, takeaway for me having done this work and, and been in this space for Lyft is no one has the, the final answer right now um, and we just have to keep talking and we have to know that, that things are going to change. Great. I'm going to, does anybody else have slides they want to show? No. You, you, you have another one? Because I love that slide. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to some questions from the audience. And um, um, th they're available. So we can, they've been sort of walking around. So if you want, car just raise your hand if you want some cards. So I'm going to start and we've got, we, we still have some time. So we'll get to as many as we can. I have two questions about jobs. 
and the impact on jobs. Um, there's the, uh, the, the one of the questions is about what happens to the Lyft drivers and, and the taxi drivers. Um, the other question is an interesting question, is that it, it, uh, which is basically if there are companies that are later adapters and they still have human drivers, is there a worry that those drivers are going to be pushed to perform more and more and more um, to keep up with the cars? And is there any sort of thought about you know how how to sort of finesse that transition? Uh, so I'll take the the lift part of that, and I'll let everyone else pin on the other things. Um, no, so I think that uh, for us, we have said, um, and, I, and I think I said this in the beginning, uh, that there's going to be an increased need for uh, human drivers and, and vehicles. Um, as this testing uh, starts to crystallize, as you start to see not just one or two different pilots going off from in different cities, but you see consistent testing from different folks, from different companies, you're going to see... Uh, and, and I think there was a slide that, that wanted to show there was actually two people in that vehicle. So I think that we'll actually see an increased uh, amount of drivers in the near term, um, we'll say the next 15 years. But I think it's also an interesting transition. Um, there were folks that used to drive horses and buggies, and they did not have a job after the Model T uh, started to iterate. So between 19, by 1913, you know, those folks didn't have, uh, didn't have employment um, in the way that they, that they previously did. Um, and I think that there's, rather than, you know, kind of looking at it as something that's going to put folks out of work, is that there's an opportunity. There's, there are going to have to be servicing centers. There's going to have to be people at those, you know, it's not just going to be one attendant at the ACE parking lot anymore. There's going to have to be multiple attendants for all these different lanes. And so I think that there's going to be a, a, an emergence of a number of different opportunities. And I think for us as a, as a company, we're interested in figuring out how we can uh, provide opportunities that will work within whatever Lyft's eventual business model ends up being in, in terms of autonomous, and maybe there'll be a couple of different uh, models, and there'll be different spaces for different folks in those models. One of the interesting things is that uh, in for scooters, uh, for our scooter permits, um, many companies actually uh, use independent contractors to go and pick up and drop off these scooters. Uh, in our application and in our practice, we actually have full-time employees that are doing that. So just because we use one model for one type of service doesn't mean that there's not fluidity in the business. And I think that that's something that you'll begin to see as our business grows and starts to have different um, you know, uh, modes within it. Um, there'll be different needs for folks in different types of employment. Um, in my industry, I mean, we already seen, you know, coming from an attendant cashier position to basically an automated facilities doesn't mean that a lot of them are losing their job, but we're moving that cashier position to become more of an ambassador that could, you know, do a variety of different functions, you know, more customer service, you know, more, you know, we're able to deliver validations or deliver, you know, I mean, there's a lot of variety, but, you know, speaking of new opportunities, we see this also as a new opportunity in our industry. There needs to be somebody that needs to charge those vehicles. <laughs> there needs to be somebody that will take care of the cleaning of the interior and exteriors of those vehicles. And again, there's more of other concierge type services that we see as new opportunities for us. One uh, final point on that as well is that in terms of the folks who are going to be accessing these opportunities, um, the ways in which they are able to leverage them across different modes of work is also going to, I think, expand. And so you'll start to see some folks will want to dip into this work and dip out of it. But there's the increased ability to move throughout different uh, forms of work, and we're starting to see that. And I think there's a number of robust conversations around how we can get in front of that um, and figure out how we can extend certain programs um, so that people can have the choice that they really do want. We have a question, um, I, I think I'll ask Marcel this, about somebody had mentioned that AVs will allow us to live further out. And so do you see an impact on er the kind of urban sprawl that um, you know, we don't want? I, I, I mean, at least I don't want. I don't want to see open space or farmland um, become more you know, single family houses. Um, and do you think that EV opens up that possibility? And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it does, right? And I think that's where um, policymakers have to really, um, you know, engage in a conversation with community stakeholders about what, what those impacts could be of that AV technology. Because, I mean, I've seen crazy images of people sleeping on their AV with a little bed, a little mini fridge. Um, you know, I think that y it could be a, a, a big reality. You know, I think that it changes the way we use our time now. Um, you know, the other thing that I, I've heard about just AVs and how 
um, it's going to create a huge market for particularly as you look at the fleet at fleet management. And so if you're not actually owning the AV, you're just utilizing it. Just think about all the entertainment options that you're going to have and the mark, the direct marketing. It's like supposed to like unleash a huge economy um, because you're going to have captive captive users. Right. And it's going to be customized to it's going to smell the way you want it to smell. It's going to have the music playing that you want to play. So there is this really um, real future where it's so comfortable in the AV that you're not going to um, you're going to be really efficient. And so I think we have to make sure that we're asserting um, policies that make sure that we're not passing on that, those negative externalities to our, um, our, our land use patterns, um, environment, et cetera. What's going to happen to Airstreams and Winnebago's? So are we going to have autonomous uh, uh, <laughs> RVs? Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone um, want to tackle either of those? Well, just just on the on the automobile club, like so randomly, I was actually I got invited to speak at. Um, there's an international federation of automobile clubs, um, and they just they're international. They they travel around the world. It's called the FIA. Um, they also oversee all motorsports as well, um, but are a collective of automobile clubs. And what we've see, what we saw at the conference that I went to is that a lot of companies are actually starting to engage in this conversation about autonomy as well. And so I think they're they're also looking like parking is about how do they reinvent themselves in terms of their membership. They understand that um, a lot of their because there are a lot of them they're membership based organizations. Um, as Rena pointed out, young people aren't pulling driver's license anymore, and so automobile clubs are starting to acknowledge the fact that their membership base is aging, and so they have to reinvent themselves as well. So they've been actively participating in these conversations around autonomy and what their roles are and what their business models are going to be. I guess my question is for the um, the person who asked this question. Are you talking like auto clubs, like you know the Corvette Club or the Camaro Club? Or are you talking like the auto club, like AAA or in the insurance folks? Just a, just, uh, do you have an answer for one? Well, uh, if you're talking about the insurance insurance folks, um, they are actively at the table. They are. Um, part of the process. They've been um, very active with legislation and at the DMV regulations. Um, so we've been having numerous conversations with them because with respect to insurance, what um, they need to figure out how they're going to start pricing their policies. Um, and so that's something that I know that the insurance companies are very concerned about. Um, so we have all been having that conversation about where to, what is the future of insurance, um, insuring these vehicles looks like for them. These are great questions, by the way. Thank you all. Um, somebody pointed out that intellectually they understand that there are potential safety benefits because they, the AVs don't get tired, they don't get drunk, you know, they, you know, they have a lot of benefits. Um, but emotionally, it's still a scary thing to give control over to a computer. Uh, so how would you, is there any plan to address people's anxiety. And I, 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 maybe it comes back to the idea of always having, of, of for a while, having someone in the car with them until they're used to it, but is there anything else? And, and, and while we're asking that, you know, something that I, I think hasn't gotten maybe as much attention is just, you know, we always have this hypothetical where it's a school bus of preschoolers or five nuns crossing the street. You know, it's always this sort of, like I've never been in that situation myself, but somehow the AVs are always gonna be facing that every day. Um, uh, but um, has there um, been thought given to the secu to security concerns? I mean, how much, and I'll ask Jin this, I mean, how much should we be worried about hacking? And you know, uh, how susceptible are these vehicles? Are they sort of networked? Or are they individual operators? Or is there enough redundancy? So those are two completely different questions. So if anyone wants to answer. The hacking one. Um, so GM takes um, hacking and privacy and security very seriously. And one of the things that we have done through Cruise and General Motors is that we've actually looked to some of the um, quote unquote most famous hackers um, that are out there. And, and we've 
are like other companies where you kind of say, okay, hack our system, do this, you know, white collar, hack our system, um, we'll pay you out. In, in some cases, we've said, you know what, you're such a good hacker, why don't we just hire you, and this is what you're going to do your full time. You love hacking, we need somebody to figure out how to break our system. Um, and so it, it ends up being a, a good relationship. Um, so, you know, we're constantly looking at um, our system. We're looking at the vulnerabilities of our system. We have people that we've brought in-house. We, we're contracting with folks. Um, we're doing everything that we possibly um, can think of. And you know, people trying to break in and to hack into systems are always going to be looking for the next step. They're going Every time you roll out a new technology, every time you roll out a new security system, they're going after it. And so we are very concerned about that. And that's one of our top priorities um, along with safety. And that goes in with safety is how do we protect people and, and our vision of protecting people is making sure that we have a solid um, system and in place and the way we do it is by having people go after it and, and um, go and attack it and we set up the best system that we can to find those flaws and to fix any of those um, before anybody else can. In terms of the, the emotional reaction um, to folks wanting understanding intellectually the benefits but still having to you know I, kind of get, wrap their mind around getting into the, one of these vehicles. I think we're all struggling with that. I mean, I think that, you know, unless you've actually been in an autonomous vehicle and probably even when you've been in one, you're kind of looking around. Um, but, you know, some of the biggest compliments I've heard about autonomous vehicle rides is how boring they are uh, and how uneventful they are. And so I think it's really just getting that exposure out there to folks. Um, and I think that also, you know, part of it is, you know, it's incumbent upon us um, of folks who are actually you know, producing these technologies to start to introduce them to, to you. Um, but, you know, the assembly member said something earlier that really resonated with me, which is around the, the autonomous trains. Um, if you've been on an airplane, you have entrusted your life to an autonomous vehicle uh, already. Uh, and as we all know, you're much more likely to have some sort of horrible thing happen to you on the way to the airport than when you're in the plane. And so, you know, but these are not things that we're thinking about. We're not thinking about autonomous vehicles equaling airplanes, even though whenever there's some sort of incident, all it's, it's about, you know, when did they, when did they re assume control of the, the, uh, the plane and how did that happen and going through the black box and kind of figuring out um, the autonomous technology and where there was an issue. Um, and how infrequently these things happen. Um, and so it's a very rare occurrence, and I think that that's a similar kind of cultural like I said, we'll start to see applied to autonomous vehicles, um, all that probably much further in the future. But we have to, you know, the Wright brothers were there, you know, and, and folks thought they were crazy initially, and now we're all zooming around on planes. And so I think that there's just a progression that has to happen um, with folks starting to normalize and, and seeing these testing, participating in one, and then potentially getting into an autonomous vehicle on some sort of shared platform to maybe when the prices are such, purchasing their own autonomous vehicle and then putting it into a shared fleet. I think one of the interesting things that Marcel was saying in terms of, you know, they believe that all vehicles should be shared. We believe that even if there is private ownership, that they should still be shared. And so you will have someone who may be part of this percentage of folks that can't afford to purchase an autonomous vehicle, that autonomous vehicle, to your point, uh, I can't afford to send it all the way back home. It's got to stay close to me because I've got a meeting in an hour that I've got to get to. So what's it going to do in that interim time? Well, maybe sometimes it's going to go and park itself, but then maybe sometimes it's going to hop onto one of these platforms and then offer a few rides. Um, and because of the technology and the data that's going to be upfront known to these, uh, these, uh, these platforms, they're going to be able to schedule it so that you're going to be, that car will be back to pick you up in time for your meeting. But in the interim has been able to provide rides um, to other individuals, so it continues that shared uh, mobility incentive. So we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna roll, run through these, and if you guys can try to, like, I'll let one of you at a time answer as quickly as we can, because I wanna get to as many of these great questions as we can. Someone asked about where we are with autonomous trucks. Now, I've heard some huge battles in Sacramento with the Teamsters about autonomous trucks, so where are we with that technology right now? Anyone wanna, anyone know? Jin, do you know? Sure, so we actually got involved with some connected automated trucks research. So in particular, the idea is to use vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication to help trucks save fuel. And the idea would be if there is a uh, leading truck driven by a human driver, and then there will be a bunch of either automation assisted or fully automated vehicle that would allow the trucks to drive closer to each other, then there will be less air drag 
And that one percent of air drag translates to one percent or point five percent of fuel saving, and that's huge because engine research people they struggle a lot to improve like zero point one percent, and uh, trucks eat a lot of fuel, so that's huge right now. Okay, um, how will AVs deal with people with disabilities? Sight, hearing, paralyzed, uh, is this something that's gonna be available to them? So um, the California Public Utilities Commission is actually pulling, putting together um, an advisory committee to actually start looking at these questions right now. Um, the City of Los Angeles is going to have a couple people on that panel as well, and I think they're gonna be working that through this, um, the PUC. Okay, someone asked a very specific question. It says, will GM give crews its tech back if they can't get the job done? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> we have 110% faith crews will get the job done. <laughs> Someone said, how much is the privacy of consumers and users a part of the conversation when it comes to AV shares and just, you know, using, let's say, your fleet of AVs? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that's a huge part of, you know, folks' data. A lot of times when folks want to access data from Lyft, they're thinking that it's our data. In reality, it's your data. <laughs> and so it's, it's your data on your trips. Um, and I think that, you know, the assembly member and another, a number of other folks in Sacramento are ensuring that your data is protected and that there's privacy um, that's, you know, being paramount in terms of you tr entrusting your, uh, your personal information to folks. Here's a really interesting question slash idea. If, if this is for Marcel, if, um, if, if the city is considering AV shared rides to be ambiguous or part of our daily routine and coordinating with transit, is there any thought of public ownership of the AVs as opposed to private ownership? Um, I think we're open to it. I mean, I think, um, I think the city has started to engage in models where it becomes like activist investor. I think um, one example is that the city of Los Angeles um, co-owns and operates um, bike sharing, right? And so Metro Bike Share, um, those early lessons from us being engaged and participating in the key performance indicators and the management really prepared us for when private bike share and scooter companies um, came to LA. It, you know, we had a, a leg up. Similarly, and I want to acknowledge my colleague, um, Susanna Reyes from the Department of Water and Power and also vice uh, chair of the Sierra Club, National Sierra Clubs, Susanna. Um, her and I are working really closely on another pilot for the city called Blue LA, and it's an all electric um, car sharing program that focuses on low-income communities, um, and that is us being involved. We've been using that um, funded um, in part by the California Air Resources Board, so we're understanding the utilization and how the use is, and so um, and it, it could very much well be that we end up buying um, fleets of AVs or controlling them in the future. Um, we currently own and operate um, through a third party um, our transit system for LADOT, and so there could be a vision where those transit fleets become AV or part of this larger mobility network. Um, and so I think the answer is yes. Okay, um, someone asked in terms of the displacement, the job displacement, if there's any research ongoing to, quanti to quantify and predict the changes and who's doing the research? I would say, I don't know of any research in particular, but I would say that yes, that is definitely happening. Um, and I think that you're starting to see folks kind of, I think part of it, if you take a step back, is that we don't know what we don't know yet, right? So we don't know what technologies are coming to displace, but there's long been research on automation and jobs and things of that nature. Um, and so that's something that's kind of a known entity and applying it to new industries is something that's starting to happen. Um, but I think that, yes, so yes. Okay. Um, Someone asks if there is or can there be a database of signs and traffic lights in each city that AVs can access and monitor in real time? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes, that, that, that can happen. I think a lot of cities are starting um, and ha having conversations about digitizing their infrastructure. I know Sidewalk Labs, which is a Google Alphabet company, um, they are really trying to take that on themselves. Um, there is a parking company that we're working with who says we can do it. Um, and, um, and I think that what you're going to start seeing is, like, remember, these vehicles, like, they have all kinds of sensors on them. 
And so I'm just thinking in my own mind about from the private sector perspective, how much of their sensors they're going to be used to monetize another business line, right? So if they're getting gathering all this data from all these miles driven, um, they're going to know where potholes are. They're going to know where crashes and accidents are happening. Um, and th I could see a place where they're actually monetizing this data, selling it to insurance companies um, to define clearly more actuarial data. data. Um, they could sell it. They could try to sell it back to cities and say, hey, we know your infrastructure better than you know your infrastructure. Um, so we're, we're aware of that. We are participating in those discussions and thinking about how we can do it ourselves um, because we believe that um, we need to also digitize our infrastructure so that we're not just um, relying on these vehicles um, to drive themselves and understand their mapping. Because if so, I don't know if anyone um, knows this, but um, all of these companies have to map the infrastructure um, before they deploy. They're not using Google Maps or anything. They actually have to go and spend a very robust amount of time driving through streets and digitally mapping everything before they can deploy. And so what happens when the city in, um, installs a new stop sign or a new development goes up? So it's like, do, do they need to go back and remap it? Or is it the city that um, starts actually just sharing that information through a live digital feed as we do improvements and upgrades? It's in real time being communicated to everyone in, in, in who's running autonomous vehicles on our streets. Great. And I'm told that we don't have any more time. I will just make one last comment myself, which is that I was lucky enough to be able to drive in an autonomous vehicle last year in San Jose. I, was, uh, I drove in the Google uh, vehicle. And I can't remember the name of their company. Waymo. So the Waymo vehicle. And um, you're right, it's a very underwhelming experience <laughs> in some ways. It's kind of like driving with, and I don't want to, I mean, I want to say this way, it doesn't insult anyone. I would say a 103 year old who just got their license that week, <laughs> um, who is really overly careful. Um, and we ran, in, we had an obstacle which was a tree trimmer in the middle of the street that we had to go around. And the car kept kind of going out and seeing a car in the distance and then going back. <laughs> To the point where I was just like, all right, this, you know, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm going to make this car. And finally, I, it kept searching its database to try to understand. You could see it was looking at the arm and the tree, trying to understand what that was. And they were showing me on the computer what it was doing. And it was watching the arm go back and forth because it didn't know if this was something that was going to fall on it or what it was because it sees all of this. And it eventually realized that I think that it had to go. And so after about four, five aborted times, it went around. But I will tell you that when it passed that vehicle, it passed within about a half an inch because it really knew where the edge of that thing was. And I guess it was trying to squeeze by. It also sees everything beyond what you can visually see. It can see things moving in bushes. It can see things happening behind you. And it's, it's trying, it, I was told that it's trying to understand what's an animal, what's moving erratically, what's moving in a predictable way. And it slows down when it moves, when it passes pedestrians. So it's, it's a, sort of a frustratingly slow and careful <laughs> drive. But um, to be in one really does make it real. And there was a, a wheel that they had their hands near, but they weren't touching it. And this, th and this was, it drove around suburban San Jose. Um, and uh, so it, it's, they're coming. Uh, and I want to thank our panel for giving us such an interesting and thought-provoking discussion. And thank all of you for your amazing questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. But thank you for being such a great audience.